It's like a constant war, and you want to settle that score. But your brain's now beaten, and you feel defeated. This goes out to the heaviest heart. Put it in your past. Oh, feel the way it's leaving. It's redemption season. Won't live the young at heart. Here's to a brand new start. We're involved in breathing to live a life of freedom. Oh, to everyone who's hit their limit. It's not over yet. It's not over yet.
sea salida de audio en todo caso. Pero que son Vení, 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 vení. Hi everyone, welcome to this new webinar. Um, it's a pleasure for me to present Dr. Tanner. Uh, Dr. Tanner has worked over the past 14 years as the director of the Epilepsy Center at Mercy Health Howenstein Neuroscience Level Center and serves as an associated professor of neurology at Michigan State University. Uh, she's a board certified neurology and with other qualifications in epilepsy medicine by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, and also a central clinical neurophysiology by the American Board of Clinical Neurophysiology. She's also a fellow of the American Epilepsy Society. Her interests include refractory epilepsy, women issues in epilepsy, the de delivery of epilepsy care in, in intellectual disability, uh, and dietary treatments for epilepsy. Uh, our learning objectives for today is to demonstrate knowledge of indications, limitations, and risk for ketogenic diets. Dr. Tanner, please welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ortiz, and thank you so much for the International League Against Epilepsy, um, Young Epilepsy Section. I'm truly, truly honored to, uh, to be here with you today. Um, so yeah, so we're going to talk about ketogenic diet uh, therapies in adults with refractory epilepsy and I often like to start by asking the question of why is it that we need other therapies in epilepsy? Why is it that
Chen show that only about two and a half percent of patients become seizure-free after the third trial with anti-seizure medication. And so every subsequent trial, and let me see if I can show you here in the slide, will only render a very, very small amount of patients um, seizure-free. It is therefore important that we talk about other options for these patients. Of course, with patients with vocal epilepsy, the first choice that we have is epilepsy surgery. Um, this is obviously not the scope, not, not what we're gonna talk about today, but this is what we need to think about first and foremost. But of course, as you know, there are many patients that are not candidates for epilepsy. Um, the patients with intractable generalized epilepsy or patients in whom um, the epileptogenic zone may be um, right overline, um, eloquent cortex or dual epileptogenic foci, or simply patients that just do not want to pursue a surgical option. And this is where we really need to think about other options. Of course, we can think about experimental drugs, about neurostimulation. And then of course here, we're here to talk about ketogenic diets. And ketogenic diets really are not new. Uh, we, we know that there's sort of depictions of it uh, dating for, from centuries ago. Um, Hippocrates talked about abstaining from food and water in patients with seizures and burns. Galen talked about the same for, for, for patients that were ill. Um, one of the first reports uh, that, that, that we have uh, was by Dr. Conklin, who reported a series of a patient whose seizures abated after 22 days of um, abstinence. Um, so this patient only had, it was a prolonged fast of 22 days with water. Um, and and I, think, I think that triggered a lot of the interest in the diet. Of course, fasting for, for this long is not a practical treatment, um, but it was really Dr. Weiler at the Mayo Clinic who created this high fat, low carbohydrate diet. Um, and, and what he was aiming to do was to sort of recreate or mimic the effects of a fasting state. Um, after that, there's been, uh, there was an interest in the diet. In fact, um, this paper by uh, Dr. Baborka was published also out of the Mayo Clinic, uh, where he actually uh, reported on um, 100 cases, and these were adolescents and even adults in the ketogenic diet. Unfortunately, with the advent of many of the anti-seizure medications now available, the ketogenic diet kind of fell out of use. And so really up until the 90s, not a whole lot of centers used it. Um, it was only used as a last resort. There was really not a lot of interest from medical societies and um, it was perceived by many still today, sadly as alternative medicine. Um, and there were very few publications and really aside from that original paper form uh, Baborka that I just showed you, there was really no use in adults. That really changed in the early nineties when this little kid uh, that you see here, Charlie Abrams, uh, showed up to see Dr. Freeman um, at Hopkins. Charlie was a boy that had um, numerous seizures, had already failed epilepsy surgery, and his parents heard about the ketogenic diet that uh, was being used at Hopkins. Um, out of desperation, they brought Charlie to see Dr. Freeman. Charlie was put on a ketogenic diet, um, and within three days, the seizures completely abated. Um, he has, in fact, been completely seizure-free since. This is actually Charlie now at a, a global meeting for ketogenic therapies. Um, he's a kindergarten teacher. Um, the reason why Charlie's story is relevant is because, well, for several reasons. His dad, Jim Abrams, in the picture that you can see, I was, uh, I heard in the way he tells the story, furious that no one had really uh, talked about the, uh, the ketogenic diet and disappointed that this was not more uh, well known in the epilepsy world and that uh, no one had suggested it earlier. Uh, but the story is also relevant because Jim Abrams was a person of, of a lot of influence and affluence. Um, and um, he's actually very well known in the world of cinematography because he, he's the producer and director of a number of movies. Um, these are just some of the handful that, that he's directed. Some of them, the funniest movies ever uh, made. Um, if I may, Airplane, probably one of the funniest ones. Uh, but anyhow, Jim and his family took on you know, a fight against, if you will, the medical establishment to um, widespread the knowledge about ketogenic diets. And he and his family started the Charlie Foundation. Again, I'm telling you the story because I think that the story of ketogenic diets changed after um, the Charlie Foundation because they really spearheaded not only research and they supported a lot of research, but also um, the, the, the widespread knowledge of ketogenic diets. 
Um, if you have not seen this film, uh, First Do Not Harm, um, also directed and produced by Jim Abrams, um, I, I hope you, you find time to see it. It's loosely based in the history of Charlie. Um, really, really nice films. So um, again, if you also if you have a chance, um, look on the Charlie Foundation website. There's tons of really valuable information for children, adolescents, for adults, recipes, menus, ideas. It's really a great source of, um, um, of information. Coincidentally, if you look at publications, you can see that, that um, really the start of the Charlie Foundation also spearheaded a lot of, uh, and started a lot of interest in research. Um, as you can see, there was you know, only a few publications during the 20th century, um, but really between 2000 and 2010, there was uh, about 167 publications. And then um, between 2010 and 2020, uh, uh, you know, about three times as much, um, over 2000. And um, I checked a few weeks before and there was about 31 publications so far. So there's been really an explosion in, in research uh, when anything related to ketogenic diets. So let's talk about the, the, the some of the basic concepts. So um, I know you've had um, through these webinars other talks about ketogenic diets, so no, I'm not going to delve too much into these, but um, as you know, all ketogenic diets have a few things in common. And number one is that they restrict carbohydrates, usually to under 60 grams per day. They have low to modest protein, they're high in fat, and they all aim to produce this metabolic state of ketosis. There are five uh, ketogenic diets that we use in medical therapy, although I suspect this is gonna change in the future and remind me to talk maybe about this at the end where really I think this is gonna become sort of precision medicine and we're gonna gear these diets more towards each patient's need. But I want you to see this and, and compare these uh, to a traditional Western diet um, on, the, on the far left where most of our Western diets really are really heavy on carbohydrates. Um, if you, like me, grew up in Colombia, my carbohydrate consumption was much higher, about 75%. But anyhow, most of us with these diets, most of our bodies burn sugar, glucose, for fuel. This is in contrast to um, the, the, the five ketogenic diets that we can use. Um, and so let's talk about each of them in, um, in some detail. So the classic ketogenic diet, um, as you can see in the graph, about 90% of the calories will come from fat. Um, this diet has a ratio of four to one to three to one. And remember when we talk about ratios, we're talking about total fat versus the amount of carbohydrates and protein combined. Um, although there's some modified versions with maybe a little bit of a lower ratio. These diets aim to mimic the uh, effects of fasting while maintaining adequate nutrition but it's a very restrictive diet. It is really hard to do. Patients um, and their families have to measure and weight every food until the last gram. Um, and they're you know, really restrictive in terms of you know, social interactions. Um, it can be given as an um, enteral formula, which is how we use it in many adults. And uh, for children, and still today, uh, many patients are historically admitted to the hospital for a few days um, in order to start the diet. The modified Atkins diet um, was really developed and started in the early 2000s at uh, Johns Hopkins. If you've ever heard Dr. Um, Kosov talk about it, he tells the story of many of his um, patients and you know, their, their parents that came to him telling him that they were not as strict with a classic modified diet, uh, modif the classic ketogenic diet and had started to loosen up a little bit the amount of carbohydrates that were given uh, to the children, but yet the kids had remained seizure free. And this is how kind of like the modified Atkins diet came to be. The guidelines for modified Atkins diet is that it usually includes about 20%, um, excuse me, 20 grams of carbs per day, depending on age. Again, that's very little. Um, if, if, if you think about it, a, a banana has about 28 grams. Um, slice of bread can be about 30 to 40 grams uh, of carbohydrates. Um, it adds a significant amount of fat and it has modest amount of protein. Patients do not have to weigh their food. They have to kind of measure and look at portions and read labels, but definitely is not as restrictive as a classic or a modified classic diet. Um, the ratio, again, depending on, on, on how you do it, um, can be a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one -one ratio. The low glycemic index treatment diet, as you can see, has also is a little bit more liberal on carbohydrates, typically around 40 to 60 net carbohydrates, 
all of them of low glycemic index treatment. And as a reminder, the glycemic index measures um, the, the, the change in blood sugar in time um, and in, you know, under the curve after um, a food is uh, consumed and it's compared to consuming 50 grams of pure sugar. And so uh, um, depending on that, uh, foods are ranked as low, medium or high, depending on how fast and how high glucose elevate um, in plasma after consuming um, that specific food. And so for instance, um, a whole orange is low glycemic, right? By the time you peel the orange, you eat a PPI piece, um, the nutrients are extracted from the fiber, then sugar um, elevates um, slowly and um, not with a steep curve. Whereas if you drink a whole glass of orange juice, then that raises your blood sugar really fast and, and uh, uh, you will have a very steep curve. And so again, in, in a low glycemic index treatment diet, uh, patients are able to eat far more carbohydrates, carbohydrates, but from this uh, list of low glycemic index, they still have to add fat. So it ends up being around a one-to-one -one ratio and modest protein. Last, uh, we have the medium chain triglyceride uh, diet. Um, this is a diet where about 30 to 60% of calories come from uh, medium chain triglyceride oils. And as a reminder, for all the other diets that I mentioned, most of the fats that are consumed are really long chain triglycerides, except if patients add medium chain triglycerides or if they add more coconut oils or, or things like that. But this is definitely a diet that, that can be an alternative for certain patients, especially children. It's more liberal in net carbohydrates. It's a little bit more palatable for that same reason. And it's also a little bit more liberal in total protein. It has some gastrointestinal side effects for which is not used more you know, universally, I should say. Uh, but these are all the diets that are available. Now, do we know how these diets work? Um, and, and I think that's a lot of work in progress. For the longest time, we thought that the mechanism of action was simply the generation of ketone bodies. And now we know that that's not the case. We know that it's far more convoluted, uh, that there's many mechanisms working in, in synergy, including um, increasing ketone bodies, um, increasing many substances that lower um, um, that are known to, to, to protect against seizures, in, increasing energy uh, production, um, as well as um, decreasing glucose, uh, reacting oxygen species, et cetera. So um, some work has emerged recently that is really interesting that aims at, at maybe unify some of these mechanisms. And um, these centers are around, for instance, um, an increase in nicotinamide um, added in dinucleotide NAD um, that in turn in decreases the activation of poly-ADP polymerases. And through that, it produces some of the mechanisms that, that we talked about. So I wanna go over some of them, understanding again that a lot of these is, is um, work in progress. So first of all, enhanced mitochondrial function. Um, we know that ketogenic diets enhance mitochondrial respiration and that they protect the mitochondria against, in the cell against excitotoxicity, that they improve mitochondrial oxygen consumption and increase ATP production and stimulate energy metabolism, um, as well as stimulate GABA synthesis. In terms of decreased reactive oxygen species and DNA damage, we know that um, that, that, that this occurs, especially uh, decrease in reactive oxygen species. We also know that there's reverse gene expression patterns um, of several genes that control these reactive oxygen species um, in both human and, and, and um, cellular models. We know that ketogenic diets lower um, inflammation as well as production of interleukins um, and that there is reduction of um, cytokines and chemokines expressions, especially those that are inflammatory. We know that there's enhanced adenosine signaling. And again, ketogenic diets have been shown to increase activation of seizure-reducing adenosine receptors and increase adenosine level. And something that we've known for a number of years is that the NAD precursor nicotinamide in combination with adenosine protects against a very specific type of, of seizures, which are um, audiogenic seizures. Finally, we know that ketogenic diets modulate channels. So we know that, that um, ketogenic diets can increase activation of ATP sensitive potassium channels, but also that they increase the probability that these channels 
um, stay open and for a longer period of time. So this is all extremely fascinating, but I think we have yet a lot to learn um, in regards to the mechanism of action. So let's move on and talk about what we know about efficacy in adults. We know a lot about efficacy in children. Again, I think um, you've had other lectures with, that, that have talked a, a lot about that. I'm not gonna talk about efficacy in children, but I wanna start by mentioning two meta-analyses that have looked at studies in adults. The first one is this one uh, by Dr. Liu and his group. They reviewed 16 studies that included 338 patients. Um, this included uh, eight studies using ketogenic diet, so classic, let's say four to one, three to one ratio, eight studies using modified Atkins, one using modified Atkins, um, and one each using low glycemic index and low uh, dose fish oil diet, sort of like an MCT. They found that the combined rate of seizure freedom was about 13%, and the combined uh, rate for responder rates was about 53%. So 53% of patients saw more than 50% seizure reduction. This other meta-analysis uh, by uh, the group of Dr. Ye uh, reviewed 12 studies different from, from the one studies on the other one. Responder rates range from 13 to 70%. Um, and, and when they looked at specific type of diets, um, they um, saw a combined responder rate of 52% for the classic ketogenic diet and 34% for the modified Atkins diet. Some of recent studies that I, uh, I think are worth mentioning are that, um, for instance, the study by the group of Green that was published in the Journal of Neurology, um, which um, showed that about 12% of patients um, became seizure-free with the diet. So sort of similar what the meta-analysis showed. And about 38% of patients had more than 50% seizure reduction, meaning they were responders. Interestingly, this has shown, just like many other studies in the past have, that retention for the rate is poor. And we'll talk about that in more detail later. Um, retention rates were 60% at three months, 43 at six, but only about a third of patients remain at about a year. So we see a, a, a theme sort of emerging here that we see about 30 to 40% of patients responding to the diet with a small percentage um, becoming, having more than 90% reduction, meaning essentially becoming seizure free. This um, study shows similar findings. This was a um, study from uh, the group of Dr. Starr in um, Iran, published in the Iranian Journal of Neurology. This was a randomized controlled trial. Um, and in this trial, they reported that 35% of patients were responder but again, uh, uh, about a third of patients did not adhere to the diet, really highlighting the fact that adherence is um, a tremendous challenge in the adults. Last, um, I'm gonna mention this, this one study uh, uh, from this uh, group in Norway, um, where um, they, they well, produce a, uh, they did a randomized uh, trial and they compared um, patients in a modified Atkins uh, diet with a control group that was on, on the regular anti-seizure medications. They really didn't find a difference in the proportion of responders. Uh, they did find a significant difference in the modest responder group, meaning 25 to 50% uh, reduction. So I think we have much to learn about efficacy. Um, those of you watching or, or watching this later, if you have data to show reported, publish, um, I think we have to, to, to really, we have much to learn about efficacy. What do we know about the efficacy in different epilepsy syndromes? As you may imagine, the data is even more limited than from you know, general uh, responder or efficacy rates in epilepsy in general. But we know that, that in children, for instance, uh, children with Dravet syndrome, epilepsy with myoclonic atonic seizures, Dusa syndrome, mitochondrial disease, and fires, and by the way, I'm gonna talk about fires later, do actually much better with the diet. And again, I'm not talking about specific indications here, for instance, um, GLUT1 deficiency, we know that that's the treatment of choice. I'm talking about what syndromes tend to respond better. So in adults, uh, the data, again, very limited. Um, some initial reports hinted at the fact that patients with generalized epilepsy responded better to ketogenic diets. Um, however, some recent studies have shown that the responder rates are um, actually not that different. Again, we need more data regarding that. 
in this um, sort of meta-analysis looking at responses uh, depending on, on um, epilepsy syndromes published by the Hopkins group by Dr. Sorvenka, um, they analyzed, um, I want to say about 10 studies that, that separated by syndrome. Um, and they reported that 38% uh, um, uh, patients, um, that there was a, a handful of patients, about 12% that had more than 90% seizure reduction or seizure freedom. Again, similar to we have seen in the past. Um, and 34% of patients with focal epilepsy were responders um, in contrast to 48% of patients with generalized epilepsy. And so again, even though the data was from different studies, right, with maybe a slightly different methodologies and maybe slightly different diets, there appears to be a higher percentage of uh, responder rates um, in patients with generalized epilepsy. More to come on that, I think, as we see more and more patients being treated with ketogenic diets. What about synergy? Do we know if ketogenic diet plays well with other treatments um, in children? There appears to be synergistic effect with sonisamide um, as well as with the VMS. Not enough data in adults to draw any conclusions. Um, one study showed similar responder rates in patients that had either uh, failed epilepsy surgery or with VNS. Um, so again, if you have data, please share with us. We really need to know more about synergistic effects um, with, with the diet. Um, I would not be surprised that we find some synergistic effect with um, ketogenic diet in vagal nerve or other types of neurostimulation in adults simply because of how um, these two neuromodulatory therapies can combine. Um, regarding the effects of ketogenic diets on, on seizure severity and quality of life, um, in general, a lot of patients report that they feel better with the diet. Um, this uh, uh, study from, from, from Norway showed that um, about 29% of patients on the diet group had a clinically relevant um, score reduction on the Liverpool seizure severity scale compared to 6% in the control group. So many patients indicate that their seizures are not as bad and not as severe. Um, and then many patients, again, report improvement in mood, in energy, concentration, and then overall quality of life. Many patients uh, report weight loss, uh, which is a really desirable um, sort of side effect of the diet for, for many of our patients. Unfortunately, many of our patients with epilepsy due to even side effects of our common anti-seizure medications will be overweight um, or be obese. I'm gonna finish talking a little bit about ketogenic diets in um, super refractory um, status of lepticus and, um, and also NORS and FIRES. Um, many of you are obviously uh, very familiar with this definition, but as a reminder, refractory status of lepticus is identified as status persisting despite the administration of at least two uh, parenteral anti-seizure drugs, including an appropriately dosed benzodiazepine. And we define super refractory status of lepticus as status persisting 24 hours after the onset of anesthesia um, or recurring um, after withdrawal of anesthesia. Um, we know that, that many cases of status of lepticus, as many as one in five, will progress to refractory. And then of those, another 22% continue to progress into refractory status of lepticus. Even though we've developed you know, other you know, therapies over the years and we have more anti-seizure medications available as IV form, um, super refractory, so refractory and super refractory continue to have really high morbidity and mortality. So the ketogenic diet has emerged as a really kind of promising um, um, adjuvant theory for these uh, uh, therapy for these patients, um, in part because again it can be given um, um, via an esophagic tube, it has a relatively quick onset, and um, now several studies have shown that it's feasible to administer in the intensive care unit. Also, because as opposed to high dose anesthetics, it doesn't have the uh, deleterious hemo uh, hemodynamic adverse events. So um, a number of, of case reports um, have been published. I think probably the first one is this one now uh, from uh, Dr. Bodnan in, in England uh, that showed the use of ketogenic diet. This was, um, I think only one patient had been 31 days on the status of lepticus. Um, uh, we, you know, not reported uh, days to ketosis or resolution, but after that more and more cases came in um, all showing 
um, you know, that, that there was a, a modest improvement in, in terms that many of these patients had resolution of the status um, in that in many of these cases, um, ketosis was detected. Um, in terms of actual studies, uh, the, um, in 2014, Dr. Takur published a series of 10 patients. These patients had been in status on average of 29 days. So think about that. I mean, these patients had been in status of because for a month before the ketogenic diet was introduced um, and have tried and failed an average of eight anti-seizure medications. Uh, but they all achieved ketosis and 90% of them, um, the status resolved after introduction of the ketogenic diet. Uh, the paper by Cervenka um, enrolled 15 patients. Um, the average time uh, to start the ketogenic diet was about 10 days. Uh, patients had failed eight anti-seizure medications, achieved ketosis in an average of two days, um, and 73% of patients had the status resolved. Um, then the study by our group, um, actually here at Howenstein Neuroscience Center by um, um, our group in collaboration with Dr. Francis, he was our neurointensivist. We enrolled 11 patients. Um, we actually started the ketogenic diet um, within 24 hours of, of when the patient was deemed refractory. Um, and therefore it was much earlier. Um, consequently, patients had only failed about three on tri-seizure events because we didn't wait that long. Um, ketosis was reached really fast within a day and a half and all our patients had the status results. So I think this really shows that this is a really good avenue uh, that can be tried in these patients um, and that is relatively safe. The side effects are usually manageable and that is really feasible in the complex environment of the ICU. In terms of NORS and FIRES, um, again, just to, to um, go over the definition. So NORS is the explosive onset of refractory status epilepticus in a previously healthy individual without a history of epilepsy. And then FIRES is a similar syndrome it was previously used mainly in the pediatric literature, but now, as you know, it's classified as a subcategory of MORS uh, that requires a prior uh, febrile infection with fever starting between two weeks and 24 hours. So one of the really interesting things is that the pathology um, of NORS and fires is not completely understood, but we think that there is a really strong immune-mediated or complex inflammatory response. We think there's probably a cytokine storm with imbalance of the pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. And theoretically, then the ketogenic diet should do really good um, because as we discussed earlier, there's decreasing the levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, decrease in reactive oxygen species and improve mitochondrial function. Um, in, in the 2018 NORS consensus uh, review article, which um, I invite you to review, uh, the ketogenic diet had really positive effects um, in 51% of patients with, with NORS um, and in 67% of patients with FIRES. Um, again, a recent paper by, uh, uh, published by, by the uh, Hopkins group showed that um, in 10 patients out of 20 that were put in a ketogenic diet um, uh, that had NORS, um, the status of lepticals resulted in seven patients after initiation of the diet um, with a mean time of about 14 days. So, um, again, just like I think we need to really learn about the specific or the best patients in whom the ketogenic diet will do well in, in adults with refractory epilepsy, we're going to find more and more um, which patients with um, status epilepticus will benefit the, the most. I suspect many of these with inflammatory um, etiologies will benefit. Um, I know there's a, a trial going on um, here in the United States looking at status in the setting of traumatic brain injury. Um, and I know uh, Dr. Cervenka from the Hopkins group is um, spearheading, looking into this in more, um, in more detail. So more precision medicine, if you will, looking at how, how to best use ketogenic diet. Um, adherence to the diet, um, just in general for our adults with epilepsy, um, again, is a tremendous challenge for some reason. Um, so adults are really good at enforcing the ketogenic diet in their children. So if you're, you know, a parent of a kid with epilepsy, apparently you're really good at enforcing the diet, but when he's with us as adults, uh, we're terrible dieters. Uh, this should not be a surprise. Anyone that has uh, tried a diet to lose weight or whatever, we know that, that we're, you know, only very rarely uh, successful at sticking with the diet long-term. Um, 
across the studies that compliance, um, it's anywhere between you know, 30 to 60% in my own group, in my own experience running a ketogenic diet clinic for the past almost six years, uh, retention rate is really poor. I mean, um, about um, only a third after um, 12 months. Um, some studies have suggested that if you supplement uh, the diet with um, a ketogenic formula, for instance, to um, supplement the meal or to replace a meal increases the compliance. And definitely if patients perceive improvement early, that will obviously improve compliance. Um, sometimes patients that do not see improvement right away, of course, are the ones that are less likely to stick with the diet because um, it is still um, a challenging diet to follow. Contraindication in adults. Um, so similar to, to most contraindications that you know, uh, disorders of fatty acid oxidation and transport, uh, porphyrias, liver failure, organic acidurias. Um, you know, of course, there's a lot of inborn errors of metabolism that would prevent from us for trying ketogenic diet in adults. But uh, thankfully for most of us adult neurologists that do not know anything about pizza neuro, uh, most of them will have been diagnosed during childhood. So that's rarely an issue. In terms of side effects, um, the most common ones are listed here. Uh, we see often constipation is probably the most uh, common one. Um, I think um, really talking to the patients about enough fiber and enough vegetables where most of the carbohydrates will come from usually eliminates the issue. Um, rarely there's been some reports of diarrhea um, that can occur early or if patients use a lot of uh, medium chain triglycerides like MCT oils, but for the most part, it's, it's kind of the opposite is constipation. Um, nausea and vomiting can occur as well as some uh, reflux disease that's usually because of course, as you know, fats tend to sit in our stomachs a little bit longer. That usually goes away and, and, and it improves. Weight loss, as I mentioned earlier, um, can be a side effect. Um, it's, it's desirable for many patients. Um, we are actually conducting a retrospective review in our own patients to quantify what this weight loss is, but it's, um, again, rarely an issue and, and for the most part, a, a desirable um, side effect. Uh, some women have uh, reported menstrual irregularities. And there could be deficiencies in certain vitamins and as well as zinc, selenium, and carnitine for which then every patient on a ketogenic diet should take a multivitamin, calcium, vitamin D, um, as well as um, in some cases, even added supplements with carnitine. Um, in terms of uh, the most important side effect that, that people think about is uh, really lipid profile in cardiac health. Um, we don't have a lot of data. Again, if you have some, um, continue to share with us. Uh, um, most studies show an initial increase in total cholesterol in um, LDL followed by normalization within six months to a year. And I think that reflects that how our bodies can adjust uh, to metabolizing fats later on. Um, there's one study that showed increased levels of the small dense LDL particles. And those are the ones that are bad in the sense that they're the ones who tend to stick to the walls of the arteries. Uh, compared to studies to control groups not exposed to ketogenic diets. Um, we don't know a whole lot about long-term cardiac health. Um, I found uh, a few studies that, that measure the uh, carotid intima media thickness, which is a really good way to measure um, um, cardiac health and found no differences in patients with uh, ketogenic diets uh, compared to controls. Um, furthermore, I think there's some growing evidence that, that long-term ketogenic diets can have a lot of benefits for cardiac health. Um, some of it may be a decrease in hemoglobin A1C and decreased requirements uh, for insulin, um, but we don't know a lot of these. We don't know about long-term side effects. So again, something that, that we have to stay tuned um, and continue to monitor, because I think that's a, a concern, um, you know, obviously for many patients. In regards to pregnancy, um, as of now, we again, we just don't have enough data. We should have more data. I think um, not only we're using more and more ketogenic diets for um, women with epilepsy, but um, there is a lot of use of keto diets in, you know, in, in the general population to lose weight. And so I think we should start seeing a lot of data of, of, of women that have non-ketogenic diets during pregnancy, but right now we just don't have. Um, I think right now we're not recommending ketogenic diets um, in pregnant patients or women planning pregnancy, 
um, simply because there uh, appears to be some evidence for altered embryonic organ growth um, in disturbing anatomy. Um, the only reports in the literature that I could find were two reported cases where patients became pregnant while on the ketogenic diet. Um, in one patient, they were, uh, you know, their, their baby didn't have any developmental concerns by 12 months of age. Well, in the other one, which I think was a patient that was also on the Motrigine, uh, there were uh, bilateral ear deformities. Um, this is the photograph from the paper um, like that. So I, I think I'm going to uh, finish here. I think we're uh, right in, uh, at the end of our time. And um, I, I think I want to make a few points. Number one, that ketogenic diets are um, are feasible um, and are um, safe so far for adult patients with intractable epilepsy. Uh, that the ideal uh, candidate for a ketogenic diet as an adult is a patient that has, um, you know, obviously GLUT1 deficiency syndrome is, is like the treatment, um, obviously. Uh, we know extrapolating from kid studies, um, Angelman syndrome as well as tuberous sclerosis complex. But also think about your patient with genetic generalized epilepsy, your patient with JME or juvenile sans epilepsy, the patient with focal epilepsy that is refractory, that is not a surgical candidate, the patient that fails surgery, um, but even also patients that want to limit exposure to anti-seizure medications, um, as well as the use in uh, nuanced refractory epilepsy and other super refractory status epilepticus. You have to have a motivated patient and you have to have a family that supports that patient. Um, I have found, in, again, in my own humble experience that if a patient is a mom that has to cook a meal for her own and then a different meal for the husband and for the four kids at home, um, she's probably not gonna be successful. You wanna have a family that supports that patient um, in this challenging diet, but it's feasible, safe, and we think it's, it's, it has efficacy that is similar to many of the currently available anti-seizure medications. So um, I hope this uh, uh, presentation was useful and um, I'm happy to answer questions. Dr. Ortiz, I think you've been muted. So yeah, we have several questions. I'm gonna divide them into um, different topics. The first one is related to um, ICU setting in ketogenic diet. So do you think it's safe to use ketogenic diet in patients who are currently being treated for a sepsis or is it safe? Yeah, you know, I think that's, that's a really common um, unfortunately, a scenario that we can be seeing in the ICU, um, you know, really um, that should not be a contraindication to starting the diet um, if, if a patient is being treated. I think um, patients cannot be obviously treated with, with propofol because of uh, propofol impedes the uh, oxidation of fatty acids. Um, also, if sepsis leads to many metabolic derangements, like for instance, um, um, metabolic acidosis that is difficult to control or hypoglycemia that is difficult to control, then um, that needs to be assessed for that specific patient. But I would say that infection per se should not be a contraindication to the diet. I think it's, it's sort of very specific to some of these parameters. Okay, so uh, and the next questions are related to how to manage uh, hypoglycemia and acidosis in those patients, because they're not only receiving anti-seizure medications, they are currently on ventilators and sedation and other types of things. So uh, how do you manage those? That those very good question. So, um, so, so I think you need to, and I'm gonna speak from my own experience because we, you know, we sort of routinely use ketogenic diet for uh, patients in the ICU. Um, the first thing that I, that I think you need to do is sort of convince, convince your ICU team, your nurses, your pharmacy to not, you know, to, to help you with this, right? It's a, it's a multidisciplinary team effort. Um, I think specifically for managed hypoglycemia, I think you can use small boluses of um, um, dextrose or something. I mean, you need to, in a way, sort of um, cut your losses and, 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 and learn how to do that in small boluses and still correct some of the hypoglycemia without completely uh, changing the metabolism and 
um, taking the patient out of a metabolic state of ketosis. And so it's doable, but I think it requires a lot of precision in doing that. Um, also using some of that, maybe a few hours apart, um, then that, that can be corrected. Um, okay. And uh, what's, what's the, radio you, the ratio you usually start in, in, in the ICU setting for ketogenic? Purposes. So we use we use three to one or four to one. We usually um, the moment the patient is deemed refractory. So so the patient has failed a benzodiazepine and say IV whatever drug of choice you know levetiracetam. Um, let's go with the acid trial, right? Levetiracetam, and the patient is a refractory. Then um, what we do is we start a protocol where we put the patient MPO, so nothing by mouth, and we um, um, fast the patient which by the way, many patients will not be fed regardless at that stage. Um, and then within 12 to 24 hours, then we start, um, we place a, a nisogastric tube and start a three to one to four to one formula. Okay. And uh, the next question is related to autoimmune encephalitis. Do you think it has an special, uh, this could be an special treatment to, to those type of patients in which we have seen several Uh, cytokines and pro-inflammatory molecules rising, and you, they usually refractory to standard treatment in terms of anti-seizure medication. Yeah, I think so. I I, I think that's one of the groups that, uh, for instance, all the viral encephalitis, um, viral encephalitis, and then you know autoimmune um, encephalitis. I I think, in my opinion, is where I think we're going to end up seeing, you know, a little bit more success with the diet. Um, I didn't present the data for specific patients, for instance, for the Cervenka trial, for the Thakur trial, or even for our own trial, I think it was sort of, uh, you know, would have consumed more time. But if you look at those individual cases, um, you see very, very much that, that uh, patients with NORS implying that, that they had this autoimmune encephalitis and then the viral encephalitis, they actually did well. So yes, I think that's part of what we're going to see is that, that these patients do very well with ketogenic diets. Uh, in terms of duration, we have two questions regarding that. The first one is, how often do you need to withdraw the ketogenic diet in adults with epilepsy without intellectual disability? And then the, no the other question is, uh, in adults, it's the standard procedure to try to withdraw the uh, ketogenic diet after two years of treatment? No, so no, good question. You know, um, no, I don't think the two year applies to adults. And, and I'm going to tell you why. One is... So first of all, we don't we don't the situation for adults with refractory is entirely different from the population of, of children that in which the diet has been studied more extensively. Um, and so the vast majority of patients that are successful with the diet um, tend to stay on the diet longer than two years. Um, and, the, and, and one of the reasons is, for instance, driving in many you know developed countries. Um, the risk of having a seizure and losing driving privileges is huge. And so, but regardless, the risk of seizure recurrence after discontinuing the diet is, is, is huge. So adults that are successful on a modified Atkins diet tend to stay longer. We don't discontinue the diet after two years. Um, and then that should answer the question about duration. We, again, I have patients, um, actually, I just recently saw a patient in my ketogenic diet clinic who was one of the earlier patients that I saw, and she has been in the diet for about six years, successfully doing continuously modified Atkins diet. So I think duration is just something that we don't know how long we have to keep these patients. Part of that is the discussion with, for instance, about um, cardiovascular health and, and, you know, carotid thickness and, um, And, and, and again, cardiac health, because I think that's going to determine how much we can push these patients. Um, I know there's a couple of cases reported of patients that have been on ketogenic diet for, for several decades um, and, and have not shown any um, you know, bad side effects. I think one of them was a patient that showed up that, that no one followed and the patient continued ketogenic diet for like from childhood to the age of 55 and nothing happened. So um, But right now, no, we do not restrict to two years in adults. Okay, uh, you, you, you start with specific situations. So uh, 
do you think it's contraindicated or you have you need to be cautious with patients, elderly patients or patients who have had a coronary disease or myocardial infarction due, due to high cholesterol levels or some? Yeah, you know, in the elderly, I don't know that we've studied ketogenic diets that 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 much. Um, I I think just being elderly alone should not be a contraindication. Um, I think we can, you know, for an older adult, what we have done in some of our cases is we've started um, maybe like a low glycemic index treatment diet that I think patients sort of can reap the benefits of the diet, but is not as restrictive. Um, I think in terms of patients with a strong cardiac disease, that is seen by many of us as a relative contraindication. I don't think that is an absolute contraindication. Uh, but of course, if you have a patient already with you know, really bad um, vascular and cardiac disease and coronary disease and, and horrendous LDL um, and cholesterol levels, then I think many of us would be a little hesitant to start the diet. Um, so, so again, in the recently published um, international, um, I think, standardization of, of for, for ketogenic diets, we, we publish that and we publish that, that we feel that that is a relative contraindication. Okay. Uh, what about uh, tumor patients with epilepsy? I think it's, it's related to... Yeah, that's really exciting tumors. data. Yeah, yeah. And, I, you know, again, I didn't... Um, talk about that, but that's fascinating. So as you know, there's been uh, a lot of research showing the benefits of um, of ketogenic diet in the treatments of, for instance, um, and outside of the world of epilepsy, right? Just uh, glioblastoma multiforme and as well as um, um, astrocytomas. Um, because again, what, what the research has shown is that these patients respond better um, if they have ketogenic diet on board. And so um, the, the outcomes are better if you say, for instance, receive ketogenic plus radiation therapy plus chemotherapy than if you do only radiation and chemotherapy. Now, when you intersect these two populations and patients with epilepsy uh, with tumors, I think there's, again, very few data, you know, few cases uh, reported, but it makes sense that we will use ketogenic diet in those patients. So we have two basic uh, science-related questions. The first one is, uh, related to metagenomic and metabolomic studies uh, that are in the search of uh, biomarkers in epilepsy, and they are targeting probiotics and um, intestinal flora implantation to treat uh, patients with epilepsy, and it's related to dietary treatments, not necessarily ketogenic diet, uh, to treat those patients with epilepsy. And the second one is, do you think that um, these methylation studies uh, on patients that are refractory epilepsy patients, do you think that those uh, changes in uh, methylation can be last longing and those can add to the um, mechanism of action? Yeah, I think so. That's a really interesting question. Um, so the, the whole me DNA methylation, I think is, is one of the mechanisms of action that I think we're learning. Um, whether that's long-term, I don't know the answer to that. In terms of the Got microbiota. Um, yeah, I think there's there was a paper published in Nature, I want to say two years ago, um, that looked at, at those changes, especially in mice exposed to ketogenic diets, um, and that how the change in in microbiota produced by the diet um, produce eventually an increase in GABA, which is absolutely fascinating. And whether that's long term, also I don't know. Um, but I think these are um, this is part of the mechanisms of action, and and I, I guess when you talk about mechanisms of action, you should put a big question mark because I think we're still learning about all these uh, possibilities. Okay, and since we are uh, targeting not only the US or Europe but lower income um, countries, do you think uh, there's any study regarding pharmac economy on ketogenic diet? Since these therapies, it's rather expensive and it's not easy to be achieved in, 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 in our countries. Yeah, you know, and that's, and that's unfortunate. Um, I don't think there's a lot of pharmacoeconomic uh, sort of studies looking into this. I, um, I read a paper uh, written by two dietitians in the LA area uh, where they deal with a lot of what they call food deserts, right? I mean, entire and tight neighborhoods where there's, you know, maybe a small uh, grocery store, but where it's really hard 
um, not only because these families don't have the financial means to acquire food, but just the, the, the act of walking to a grocery store is an ordeal, right? Because you have to take two buses and, and it's hard to get the food. And so definitely I think that plays a, a huge impact um, in offering the diet to some populations. Um, that said, I think one of the things we need to do is to start you know, working really hard in, in creating menus and recipes that are accessible to everyone and that are adapted um, to, you know, the cultural and nutritional um, needs of that patient. Um, I know the, I, I've heard a wonderful story about um, the, the dietitian that works for the Charlie Foundation, uh, Beth Supak, who, uh, took a trip to, I, I want to say it was Jamaica or, or Haiti and um, explore a lot of the you know, recipes that they use and, and found um, a type of protein that they could use with a similar sauce that they use for a lot of their um, stews and was able to create a keto recipe based on that. And so I think that's so critical because you know, other than that, to pretend that, that a lot of patients can go buy really expensive salmon and expensive asparagus, you know, of course, it's not going to happen, but I think we need to do a better job at, at making it more accessible. Okay, and the last question is regarding uh, how often do we need to take tests, uh, ketone bodies, uh, DEXA tests, and so on? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so usually um, what what I suggest is that we usually, that, that tests are taken before the patient starts the diet, right? And so we usually do like a complete metabolic a panel, CBC. I usually check for carnitine levels. I'll make sure the patient doesn't need to be supplemented. And then I also check for um, zinc, selenium, magnesium, ionized calcium, um, and then obviously lipid profile. Um, in terms of checking for ketone bodies, uh, patients can check um, either with um, in urine, which is a very non-invasive, uh, not too expensive method, um, or in, in plasma. Um, in in Countries where it's easy to find the, the urine strips, I ask patients to check once or twice a week at first, just to make sure they are really producing ketone bodies. Um, after patients kind of get the hang of the diet, then um, usually about once or you know once a week or maybe twice a month. Um, if you need to get a blood drawn, then you know I think um, again at first I would do it, you know maybe once every month for the first three months, make sure they're producing, you know where you would measure there is beta hydroxybutyrate. The first few months and then maybe not as often. Um, I check for lipid profile um, at three months and then at six months after that you know every six months um, and then um, about once or twice a year also also I check for uh, complete metabolic panels so like calcium, potassium, um, vitamin D etc. Um, I always check for vitamin D also before and at, you know usually at six months um, and then um, uh, what was the other question? DEXA scan for, for osteoporosis. You know, I don't know that we have studied that. I think I follow sort of the guidelines for, um, you know, in general, if it's a female of a um, uh, small frame, smokers, postmenopausals, I, I, you know, I think we do it far more often, about once, um, at least a year. Okay. So thank you again for uh, being with us at this uh, webinar. Uh, and Thank you. Please, I want to invite you all to our next Saturday. Uh, Turborn Thompson is going to talk about management of epilepsy in pregnancy. So it's going to be exciting. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you.